I work for Arthur Cox, a law firm here in Dublin. And my question is whether the multi-stakeholder model, isn't that perceived by some countries as being a very much Western valued model? Um, and for example, uh, certain countries like Saudi Arabia, maybe, or mm -hmm. other countries would definitely prefer, I think, a model we would allow them to control much more what is being said on the internet and mm -hmm. therefore go against the idea of this free internet that has been, um, I suppose, um, has been encouraged by uh, the United States, but also the European Union and generally Western countries. I thought you were going to say France there. Well, right? France. Although it's a military, it's a story. That was a very close system. Huh? Yes. So You've you answered the question, I think, already. Uh, You've you mentioned uh, good examples. I think there are countries uh, in the world that certainly think that this is a Western model and there's, especially because of this transition there's a lot of articles out there that say well this is all an American model and even if the US government leaves they leave a model which is inherently favouring uh, US business um, and I think that's obviously I think this is wrong uh, and I think it's not shared by everyone if you look around the world there's actually some countries that completely embrace this model so can think about countries like South Africa, where, for instance, they've got a lot of multi-stakeholder models. They probably don't call them that because they they are rooted in consultations with you know local tribal type uh, setups. Or Brazil is a very interesting one because Brazil, during the World Summit on Information Society, was one of the main proponents of taking this governance of the internet into the UN, and they evolved a lot in large part because a few years before that, I think they they set up their own multi-stakeholder model at uh, Brazilian level, something called CGI.br, who I think manage .br, but they also have a role as an NGO to very gather consumer associations, NGOs, academics, telecom regulator, the ministry, business. I think there's, I can't remember the number of representatives now, but they're, they're representative of the, the, the whole spectrum. And they have a f two or three tasks. One is to basically help develop the internet policies uh, at home, and the other is to promote local content in, in Brazilian Portuguese. An interesting thing with internet policy is that it's gone so far that they developed legislation. And so they passed a major piece of legislation called the Marco Civil that was actually signed during that then Mundial Conference last year. But it was actually drafted by this multi stakeholders set up. And then, you know, went for Parliament, of course, and was adopted. And I think we got too many changes by Parliament. So you can still have this mix between the, the traditional democratic process, but policies and, and draft you know, bills, basically, which are developed by the multi-stakeholder model. And you know, we were just saying before, you know, as a civil servant, I love this multi-stakeholder, I'm a former civil servant, because I can, I can float ideas with the community and I will know whether it makes sense or creates too many problems. And if we can all agree by consensus that this, this is a good idea, then we know it's going to be implemented far more easily. Uh, so I think it makes for better regulation generally. So I think it works well. So, yes, there are countries that still think that this is a Western-dominated um, model, um, but I think the realisation that it's, it doesn't have to be. And, in fact, the key to it not being a, a, a Western-dominated model is simply to increase participation. And that's actually my day job, which is my, my job is global stakeholder engagement. My long-term goal is to increase the numbers of European stakeholders that take part in ICANN. That's why I would very much in, invite you all to come. I, I can do a, a separate presentation every day on how ICANN works, how you can have an impact, what is relevant for you. There's a lot of lawyers already, so we can have others, but, you know, uh, not just lawyers. But, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, my name is William Fagan. I am a member of this institution, also a fellow member of IIC. Yes. Just to, just to follow on from that, um, I was the comms regulator in Canada next door to Saudi Arabia. And the first time I can came to see me... I knew your name. <laughs> so the first time I can came to see me, I knew America was in the background. <laughs> reluctant to engage. So we gave some thoughts and about a year later a guy who was I think it was an Egyptian guy was organizing the regional thing and they came back with what was looking more like a multi stakeholder model. And the Qataris immediately engaged with it and now they're very enthusiastic enthusiastically involved in ICANN and ICANN regional matters. That that was the key to it because the old model now, I hope that when you make the final step, hopefully it will be a Dublin declaration. That's <laughs> that, that's because, because you, must, you must be able to see this 
this this thing happening that as you as you as you build towards the multi-stakeholder model, this acceptance. My question, though, however, I just wanted to add the information to say the moment you mentioned Saudi because I was an explorer. Um, down to you said because there's only one of each domain name. The area which, and I, I don't know what the possibilities are because we're talking millions and billions here is email. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine had his email hijacked about a month ago. Okay. Is there any way at all with the, your knowledge and your background that we can start working towards that email can become a person's personal possession mm -hmm. that can be protected? Mm -hmm. uh, because I had to ask him, this is a senior person who used to work in UAE, in fact, mm -hmm. in fact, I'm meeting him on, on Thursday, and he's going to tell me the whole story about how his email got hijacked. But is there any way of protecting something which affects so, the individual rather than business? Yeah, yeah. And if there's a massive amount of that hijacking of email that comes from that out there. So it's so very... Maybe uh, I'd love to hear your um, I'm not so sure it's... Um, I mean, it could be discussed within ICANN, but I don't think it's just an ICANN issue. Uh, I know it's been I know it's been discussed before. I've heard that before, as to whether you can sort of have your email for life. In theory, you can. So, for uh, just as an example, not in theory, you can, in the sense that, for instance, you can ha you can buy a dedicated uh, domain with your name on. So, for instance, you could have Fagan.com, right? And then you can have you know email at Fagan.com. As long as you continue to buy your domain name, it will be always attached to you. It's so that though, it? well, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be. No, domain name these days, it's uh, a few euros, depending on what you choose. No. Barry, uh, Barry Groves.com, 19 euro a year. 19? Oh, yeah, right. 19. 19. 19. Yeah. Could, yeah. 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 With a registrar. But there is, uh, what, you know, there's a pro I know it's been discussed in, the, in, in privacy discussions mm -hmm. in terms of whether you could consider an email address uh, personal information. So I know there's been a lot of some discussions about it. Um, you know, that's an interesting. I I need to check. I mean, it could be that something could be done within the ICANN setup, and certainly, you know, someone like you could come around the table and say, "Ah, I want to start a discussion on this." That's un unfortunately, unfortunately, how it works. It's very open. But that, I, I could come back to you on that. Yeah, one. no, I I, 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 I talked to my friend on Thursday. <coughs> come back to us. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. John Jack. Uh, Ken O'Brien's my name from Comreg, the local yes. communications regulator. So I suppose we're a participant in the uh, net neutrality debate that's going on through Berwick uh, yeah. at the moment. And uh, the Council of Ministers is debating all the mm -hmm. ins and outs of net neutrality. Yeah. So just one question where, where, where would you draw the line in terms of allowing specialised services, mm -hmm. uh, differentiated services? compared to general internet yeah. activity. So, taking off my ICANN hat, just trying to do it as a personal individual with a bit of background in the issue. So, interesting, the interesting thing is to, to define specialised services. Mm -hmm. The way I try to think about it is, um, for instance, I've got cable at home. They've offered me video on demand and music on demand for ages. And they, de they do deliver it concurrently to my open internet access. And there's never an issue that the, 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 the stream that delivers the specialized service, for instance, the video, um, you know, plays against my, uh, the delivery of, of my open internet service. It never has a negative impact on it. So I don't have a problem with it. I don't think anyone would have a problem with it, whether it's a user or an internet company or whatever. So I think it can actually completely coexist, but what you need to make sure of is basically that you don't have a negative impact. Now the way that it's been drafted in Parliament was 95% right, but they, at the last minute, they added some crazy wording that was just about strict admissions controls, etc., which is just too complex. So I know why it's creating problems in council. I do think you just need a distinction between the two, and they can coexist. I don't, have, I don't think there's a big problem between the two. It, where it becomes a problem is when, if, is if you have a wording that is that is so put together in a way where, as a telecom operator, you could mask a product as a specialized service, which is in fact an internet minus which is what has been happening, especially in the mobile world in Europe for years, where basically they say, oh, you can have great internet 
connection but it's not internet because they forbid you to use VOIP and they forbid you to use you know whatever they don't like that competes against their own services mm-hmm. and they could do that on specialized services oh no well, no it's not the internet it's a specialized service which means it's everything we like um, you know and, and that would have a negative impact on the internet so I think that's that's the key it's maintain a separation between the two and uh, don't allow for the specialized services to be a, a, an escape route that will allow throttling or, or, or blocking of, of services because it could really happen. Uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, Barry Rhodes from IMEX. Uh, simple question. How is ICANN funded? Oh, you know that, don't you? I don't. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, your colleague Nikhil Nalon knows far better than I do. So it's funded... Um, by both the registries and the registrars. Uh, in short, there's a small uh, percentage of the cost of buying a website or a domain. Sorry, it's a domain, not a website, that goes back to us. Um, so um, I think it's something like 19 cents for uh, every domain. So it's, uh, so it's not the American government. <laughs> it's, no, no, no. There's, uh, no. The contract between us and the US government is a zero yes. sum contract. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Question. Can I ask one question? Because it's, I remember I was at the, the, the standards organisation. I remember there in uh, City West in Dublin five or six years ago, it, it, there was a meeting in Dublin similar. Right, uh, ATF. Uh, yes, and it's an amazing event to see. There was 4,000 yeah, techies. techies in the room uh, working on the standards and, mm-hmm. uh, and working in a collaborative way. Yes. How do you, okay, accepting that, that the the uh, American government contract ends and, and a new kind of more uh, statutory almost uh, not statutory but kind of organised um, uh, that new governance structure with the, uh, continuing what's already happened with multi-stakeholder but that that continues how do you see the collaboration with the standard side evolving and how how how, how does that work on it? Because often what you're trying to do sometimes on the registry side, you obviously have to, it's affected by what's happening on the standard yeah, sure. side and vice versa. Yeah. How does that collaboration continue? So you have already inbuilt in the, the ICANN structure, you have a presentation from the standards bodies. So uh, the ITF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is probably the main standards body for internet issues, which is probably the one you're referring to, mm-hmm. they have... Uh, a position on the board of ICANN, statutory. So it's currently, I'm not sure if it's always the chair of ATF, but I think currently it's the chair of ATF who's a, a Finn uh, who works for Ericsson, Yariako. So he is there, he advises, so he's able to do the liaison and say, so well, actually, you know, we're developing this or that standard, Matt Clash or whatever. Plus, uh, in practice, you have a lot of the people that take part in the ATF that might be members of some of the, the committees, usually the security committees or technical committees of ICANN. So you have a lot of read across. Plus, you have another uh, seat on the board that's a technical liaison group uh, that's for the other uh, standards bodies, such as the World Wide Web Consortium, which, has, which does the website level uh, standards. So there's always, you know, again, there's always means of coordination and, and liaison between those groups. So I mentioned earlier that the internet governance, internet governance is an ecosystem or collaborative. And for many of those parts, there is some sort of formal uh, liaison that exists certainly in our world for the basic functioning of the internet there is you know, inbuilt liaison between those bodies so if we talk about the INF function for instance um, when you have the pro- I mentioned the protocol parameters so the protocol parameters are actually devised entirely within the IETF so they devise them as standards that's basically what it is it says you know you've got a, an audio format in an mp3 um, and then this is the way that an mp3 should be uh, allowed by the, the internet protocol and we'll just add that to uh, the directory effectively as an agreed way of transporting or accepting that data. So they devise it and they give an automatic instruction to IONA saying we've developed this new protocol parameter, we've made an amendment to it, please update your database to reflect that. So they have that direct link as well. So it has inbuilt uh, liaison there. And one other question if I can. Oh, sorry, Lydia. Yeah. Oh, no. Yes, I just want, and I recall that history you said at the early start. At that time, I met you at that internet conference. I also had the pleasure of meeting Vin Surf, mm-hmm. and he was he, he set out on a napkin some of the history you described and, and showed. Yeah, he was there. Yeah, and um, and I have that napkin now at home in, in, <laughs> in, in a frame. I thought it was very interesting. But 
Uh, now that opened, and it was Department of Defence funded, but not in, the, not in the sense that it was a defence project. It wasn't a defence project in that sense. But but looking back now, is one of the characteristics of that initial construction is that it did allow the level of surveillance that now is is of such concern. Yeah. Do you think, or do you see, I can taking a role, or? Uh, uh, or do you see some of the protocols or some of the basic infrastructure or the, the characteristics of the internet changing to reflect concerns people have about surveillance and to try and remove that as a, as a long-term threat to the viability of the, or the trust that people have in the internet? Yeah, so and certainly the, the, the loss of trust would affect us uh, because it's trust in the, the, the overall internet. But the surveillance is not really done at our level, as far as we know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so the, 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 it's not the DNS, the, the, the domain name system as such, that's at stake. So it's just one layer above and at the level of infrastructure, at least, if not above. And we were supposed to have one of the, the key people working on this at the moment is Stephen Farrell, who was supposed to be here today. He's not. He's at Trinity College with uh, Linda Doyle. And so it's at, it, but it, it is in the real of internet standards that we're starting to look at it. So in the IETF, so Stephen has co offered um, a, a standard last year, which was very much looking at that and saying, we haven't thought about mass surveillance when we were developing internet standards because simply we weren't thinking about it. But maybe now, in the face of what's been happening, what we should do is have inbuilt in standards mechanisms that should protect against mass surveillance. Uh, so that's a standard, it obviously requires much more discussion and since there are open discussions and there will be governments in the room, they might not like that. Uh, and let's be fair, I mean, if we're talking about surveillance, uh, you know, in EU law, in EU telecoms law, if you're a telecom provider, you have to allow surveillance. It's, it's there, it's called legal intercept. Um, it's, it's been there for uh, as long as there's been a telecoms law and it's quite draconian in some EU jurisdictions. I mean. Um, I could cite some, some examples, you know, in some countries in Europe where the security services have got an actual room that's dedicated to them at the central offices of telecom companies that only the security services have got a key to and they are able to interrogate any data that they want that goes through the pipes. That's an EU country and that's under the telecoms law which, which follows the EU directives on telecoms. So. You know, that discussion doesn't even need to go to the internet standards body. I think it's a wider discussion that needs to be, to be happening at parliamentary level, frankly, um, including the European Parliament. Um, I mean, you've got one side of the European Parliament, actually, it's probably even the same side that's saying we need to protect against mass surveillance, but that same side is saying, well, we need to make sure we have legal intercept. And, uh, you know, when I worked for internet companies, and uh, William knows that because he's seen some of my colleagues in the past, um, you know, people contacted us and said, well, you need to be regulated as a telecom company. And... Believe me, they weren't really interested about consumer protection and competition. The number one thing that they asked, uh, and usually they would back off from any other demand if you said yes, although I don't remember we ever said yes, uh, was that you know they uh, they wanted to intercept communications. So it's 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 a very complex question because but we, it's it's the the, the long standing um, not dilemma but balance to be had between privacy and security, and that's a very fair balance to have. We need to protect ourselves from uh, the, the, the theft of our personal information in some shape or form as much as we need to protect ourselves and our nations from security threats. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of confidence in, our, in, in the Internet, but it's, it's a wider societal problem that politicians need to handle. And I think, actually, Internet companies came out saying that. There was a collective of the big American companies, like Microsoft, Apple, Google, all, all co-signatories, and they said, it's all interesting, this whole mass surveillance debate, but we're just caught in crossfire. It's for you governments to sort out at an international level how you handle surveillance. We can't be, you know, it's not for industry to solve it. It's not for business to, to do it or others. It's, it's for governments, of course, through the democratic process, ideally. Last question. Well, you've actually somewhat addressed, my name is Deirdre Kelly, I'm also a lawyer in the government, and I think she has here. And I suppose I would be familiar with ICANN in terms of, say, people challenging um, registration of domains in bad faith and you have a dispute resolution process and ICANN actually acts as uh, a conduit for a resolution of disputes mm. um, and that's very much in the IP space mm -hmm. but now I think you know one of the biggest developments in the last few years in technology has been 
data management, data controlling, data regulating, data, data protection. And what I think you've addressed the tension between the government players and perhaps those which are, are on the um, internet. I do think that there's, there's probably another role there to act in relation to those who who do abuse data and use domain names in a way that, you know, and I just wonder what yes. I can, I'm sorry, are there in terms of sort of advancing corporate governance in that area? Yeah, I mean, um, hopefully I'm getting the full sense of, of your question. Uh, I think the answer is yes, which is that um, we have, for instance, we're reviewing the, the so-called Who is directory, which is a directory that anyone can interrogate, where basically you can, you can find out who owns a website in short. Um, and so when you buy a website you have to enter your name and a few personal details and normally this is to make sure that you can be contacted if there's a problem with your website uh, or indeed for law enforcement agencies it's a way of being able to go after people that abuse either IP or other things could be counterfeit, could be any, any sorts of consumer protection or cyber crime etc. So the discussion about reviewing this uh, directory at the moment includes a lot of discussions about privacy because law enforcement, which is very present in ICANN, of course, is saying, and so is the IP lobby, um, saying, look, we need to have as much data on owners of websites as possible. And then you've got the registries and the registrars, who are the people sort of managing the domain names, saying, hold on, we've got to comply with, for instance, EU data protection laws, which will, not, which will stop us from doing all the stuff that you want. And then we've got NGOs around the table saying, hold on, this is all against freedom of speech and privacy and this and that. So you have... Discussions of that nature that are that are happening very much now. Um, I'm not sure if that addresses exactly your query, but I'm trying to illustrate the sort of discussions that are happening. So, if it's in terms of again IP protection, for instance, or other types of consumer safeguards, there's always discussions. If there's a new problem, new type of problem, as long as it's related to the domain name system or numbering, in theory, it can be brought up. I'm more than happy to, if you've got a specific one, I, mean, I can look at it. Huh. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. Um, we'll finish there. If I can conclude there with just three very simple short thoughts. Firstly, I was just thinking that the Institute here actually, in some ways, is a multi stakeholder stakeholder venue. We have regulatory, business, academic, other, and, and uh, well, however, not legislative or anything like that. It does provide maybe a, a further example of what you said the benefit of multi stakeholder meeting places. Um, uh, secondly, I, I was very taken, you said, as a former public servant. The opportunity such approach provides to free you up as a public servant. I was very excited recently last year the launch of Code for Ireland. I think it was a is a kind of a coding yep. multi stakeholder um, facility, and I think particularly for people in the public service, the ability to try things out, to engage with people, and not in a fearful way that you're going to get hammered if you make a mistake or things don't work. I just thought for me it was the most exciting aspect of it. It could free up the public service. To work in a flexible way, which isn't always the characteristic of, of our of our public service system. And last, I suppose, just reflect on what we were talking about earlier, just to share it more widely. One of the, this whole the characteristic of the internet, as we're saying, is collaborative. It works. It's, it, it's, and it's also competitive. You know, it allows new technologies evolve quite quickly. And we were just reflecting earlier on in terms of I think it's the the letter from the bishops of England to the, the Anglican bishops in Britain to the British political system saying. Competition and collaboration are not competing, are not opposing forces. They both oppose, oppose monopoly. And, and monopoly, whether it's a state monopoly or monopoly, whether it's a private monopoly, is not in the interest of collaboration. Or doesn't, collaboration breaks monopoly. Competition breaks monopoly. So the two are not competing. You can have both competition and collaboration, and, uh, and uh, with monopoly being the enemy in some ways, whether it is that, that a state is centrally controlled. So that collaborative approach can work with a competitive approach. And that's not a small kind of a uh, thought, I think, to, to leave us with today. Thank you. Thank you for coming over to Dublin. Thank you very much.